Hi, everyone, and thanks to the uh, joining us for the post-game pint. I'm John Bonus with Twins Daily. I'll be your host. And before I introduce our panelists, here's a couple of things you can look for. If you did not see the opening screen, if you're just arriving late, make sure that you put out an obscure word. Our uh, panelists will be uh, scouring those to find out the most challenging ones because they want to win this game that we play where they have to use that obscure word or phrase sometime during the uh, during the show and we'll have a vote on it later. So we're not going to give, we're not going to let you guys vote for uh, any crummy uh, easy words. We want some good hard stuff that uh, they're going to challenge to slip them in. Uh, you'll also find a Q and A area for questions. We're going to be uh, going to that a couple different times during the show. And we want to hear what you have. There's also a chat area. You can chat with us and you can give us your thoughts on the game. Uh, we will react to those. There's going to be plenty of time. We really are looking for you guys to drive the discussion. And uh, with that, let me introduce our panelists. We have got, Matthew Taylor. Hi there, Matthew. Uh, what did you uh, What did you have for your post game pint whenever it started? <laughs> yeah. So background for people who are just signing on now. John had the idea that we were going to all sign on in the top of the ninth and watch what potentially could have been a no hitter together at least the end of the game. So I poured myself a glass of uh, screwball peanut butter whiskey for the ninth inning and to enjoy. And I. Uh, had that long gone about three innings ago, so I am not on running on any liquids right now, but enjoyed the uh, whiskey and the couple extra innings that it was still lasting for. And I also want to welcome Matthew Trueblood. Matthew, what did you have for your postgame? I think I saw you finish your uh, beer at some point, probably uh, midway through the ninth as well. Yeah, yeah, I had it timed out really well. Uh, it was a Blue Moon Belgian White. Good, Good basic beer, yeah. I've got my, uh, I've got a, I tweeted out that I had a little Freud 10 ready to go one way or the other. I absolutely needed it. I have refilled that. I am not going to drink a post game pint of it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to slowly sip that as uh, we make our way through here talk towards midnight. Uh, the Twins win the game tonight, four to three over the Milwaukee Brewers. This game had everything. It had, uh, it was uh, energizing. It was, was exhausting. It was, uh, 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 the uh, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat all in uh, all in about a ten, ten minute span. We saw uh, a performance for the ages, and we also saw something that was we actually we saw something we did see something historic, and then we saw uh, the twins closure that we we're all counting on to um, to break down. Uh, guys, uh, this should be the easiest game in the world to have uh, some sort of take about. So let's uh, let's hope, uh, let's hear what you guys each have for your uh, pre game take for your post game take. Go ahead, Matt. Sure. Well, um, I guess the long and short of it is Kenta Maeda was fantastic, but you can see the chinks in the armor in games like this. Uh, you could see that Taylor Rogers is just not that same guy this year. It looks like maybe there's something a little off with his, his arm angle at release. Um, and then the – stuff you waited through in the ninth inning and afterward in terms of rotating guys out of the game you ended up playing with you know half the starting lineup by the end of the game um so maybe a little bit of over management a little bit of the bullpen which we still view as a strength and certainly the depth is but there are chinks there and we started to feel them out at the end of this one um well i mean you absolutely i think we could talk quite a bit about some of the decisions Rocco made. Uh, I don't think he's, uh, you know, I don't think they were bad decisions, but uh, they didn't work out very well. And, uh, you know, that's ultimately what he's going to get judged on is whether or not, to, you know, he's not going to get judged on the fact that, um, that Marwin Gonzalez might be a slightly better, um, slightly better defensive first baseman if Marwin Gonzalez ends up snow coning a, a ball or doesn't get off the base to get it than a ball that, you know, Miguel Sano, who's probably a little bit bigger, ends up getting, right? So, I mean, that's, that's what happens when you're the, uh, when you're the manager, right? You're going to get second guessed on stuff, even if it, it appears that it's not such a terrible decision in the moment. Uh, Matthew Taylor, what did you uh, what did you take as your take of the game on this? Uh, what, 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 you, what do you want to come up, come away from talking about? Yeah, I think Matt Trueblood hit on most of the you know the high points. I think Maeda is something that even though his start got 
somewhat washed away in all of the drama that came afterwards. I think it's still a start that we're going to remember for a while. It was one of the best starts that we've seen by a twin starter in a really long time and was just incredible and something that, yeah, I think there's going to be articles written about that start and his pitches and he was just working all three of his pitches tonight, his fastball, his splitter, and his slider were just all incredible. And so incredible stuff from Maeda, and that is definitely a takeaway. And then the other one, I think, is just it was our first our first look at, from the Minnesota Twins' perspective of extra innings. And so I was excited. I've seen it, obviously, in minor leagues as they've been running with that for a couple of years. And I don't know. I really enjoyed the extra innings aspect of it. I was telling Matt in our little talk here before the post game pine started, but I liken it a little bit to uh, college football overtime and just how there's a lot of strategy and different things that you can do. And it depends on if you're home team or the away team and if you're going first or second and how you're going to play it and you're looking ahead into who you're going to have coming up and do you want to bunt or not. And I really enjoyed it the extra innings and I don't know if it's going to stick past this year, but I think it's a lot of fun. I don't think it takes away too much from the spirit of baseball and think there's extra strategy in there that was interesting and fun to watch. You know, I actually kind of agree with you. I was not excited about this at all. And in fact, I, I think I've been sort of on publicly saying, yeah, I, w- I wish it would have been a lot more comfortable with it if they started in like the 11th inning or these 12th inning or something and give us a couple of extra innings of regular baseball. But I did enjoy it. I mean, I did enjoy the extra pressure of starting with somebody out of second base. It did make – we talked a little bit. We were talking during, during the uh, thing here about how uh, it, started, it started making me wonder, okay, so that we've got our four, five, six up facing, you know, Hater. They've got their seven, eight, nine up hit facing Theobar. bar. You know, is this something where you're trying to play for the tie or you're trying to play for the win? Like, you just want to get to the next inning so you get back to your numbers one, two, three pitchers. But then who do they got in the bullpen? Who are you going to end up facing on that sort of thing? It was a different strategy with a guy on second base that ended up being something I thought about the strategy a lot more than I did with uh, the bases empty. Um, Matthew Trubler, what do you, what do you, how do you, how did you react to the extra innings thing? First of all, what was your impression going into it? And then what was your impression coming out of it? Yeah, uh, my big argument all along has been uh, I'm kind of okay with it because over the last several years, we've just seen so many games stretch out to preposterous lengths and the way that that sets back a team just based on the way most teams run their pitching staffs these days. Uh, What I would prefer is if the runner started on first base because I think you add even a little more strategy, you add a little more value to speed. Can that runner that you're starting on first steal a base for you and get himself into scoring position you're not starting them in scoring position Um, but that's not necessarily enough of a nudge to accelerate the end of a game the way they want to and tonight we saw that you know starting a runner on second doesn't guarantee that you're accelerating the end of the game it can still go on a few innings but if it does it's going to be really fraught the whole time you know the teams are going to be locked in that tense battle they're going to be there's going to be traffic. There are going to be five-man infields. There are going to be uh, decisions about whether or not to bunt and whether or not to issue an intentional walk. So um, while it still might be not be my ideal solution to the problem, uh, I'm finding it a little more exciting and a little more easy to adjust to than, than I expected it to be, just like I think most people. Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it, it turned it into sort of a um... – past the popcorn game. You know, it was one of those things where, you know, you, I wanted to sit and watch uh, you know, play by play and just see whether or not, uh, you know, well, let's see what happens here. Let's see what happens here. Let's see what happens to this and that. Let's see if they decide to bunt here. Let's see if they don't decide to bunt here. And in fact, there, my, my uh, mentions blew up on Twitter about people wondering like, hold on, why aren't we bunting here? Frankly, I was second guessing a lot of the uh, decisions that were going on or not being made on there. There's some players that I really thought would, be bunting that weren't bunting and I was I was I would have liked to have unpacked a little bit why they weren't you know, whether or not the Brewers defensive positioning was really you know taking that away or not it didn't feel like it was but we were really hesitant to bunt in those last couple of weeks so that ended up being a significant piece of it um, for me my take of the game is going to be the um, the Rocco Baldelli uh, decision 
Rocco Valdelli had a hell of a decision to make after the eighth inning. And uh, I was interested to see which way he would go with that. Maeda has, you know, they have been exceedingly careful with Maeda so far. He has thrown between 75 and 85 pitches, I think, all, all season long. He'd never gone over 85. So when he got to 100 uh, to finish out, I think, the seventh inning, I wondered, I wondered then if, that, if he was going to be out. And when he got to 113 to finish out the eighth inning with his Major League Baseball career record being 111 pitches, so he'd already gone two pitches over uh, to get out of that inning, I really wondered whether or not they would continue to pitch him in that position. Now, you know, you don't have to make the decision, and ultimately they did. You, you don't have to make the decision, was, listen, we're going to stick with this guy for the whole game. You don't have to commit to, okay, we're going to give him another 15 pitches. He's going to get to 130. And I would have liked to have known, maybe, maybe Brock will talk about it in the post game. How many pitches were you prepared to let him go out there for? You know, or was it a, well, I won't let him throw 140. At 113, you decided I'm going to let him throw 114. You know, I'm, I'm going to let him go and I'm going to let him start and we're going to see where it is. And then, you know, at 120, maybe I start getting a little, little pickier. I mean, they certainly had Rodgers warmed up and ready to come in at that time. Um, I don't know. To me, that was one of the more interesting discussions of the game. I, I kind of liked how he did it. Um, and frankly, uh, I don't think it was a mistake, even, even though they blew the lead. Uh, and you can point to that as maybe one of the reasons why they blew the lead. I don't really feel like that was the reason they blew the lead. That was a, I think, uh, Matthew Taylor, did you mention it was a 68 mile per hour uh, exit velocity hit that ended, ended up getting there? Uh, in fact, we ended up looking up the, uh, the term for Texas leaguer in Dixon's Baseball Dictionary. This is, I don't know if any of you guys have this, this is called Dixon's Baseball Dictionary, is every term known to mankind. Here's what the, uh, ant, the synonyms are for a Texas leaguer, which is what that was called. I'm going to read a few of them. The awful, the banjo hit, the bleeder, the blooper, the drooper, the hump pie, the humpback, the humpback liner, the leaping lena, the looper, the percentage sinker, the plunker, the pooper, hunker, smell hit, squibber, stinker, and sucker. And that's what he got ended up getting beat on today. And uh, so I... I don't, I don't think you can take anything away from Maeda, and I don't think you can take anything from Rocco Baldelli for sending him back out there to do that. Now, if Maeda ends up arm, with arm problems a week from now, well, then maybe <laughs> I'll change my tune on that. I don't know. So, all right, those are our twins' takes. Uh, I'm going to throw up a poll real quickly here about um, – hold on for one second. Just what uh, – which, uh, which of the twins' takes you guys liked the best I'm talking about? Uh, Rocco's decision. And in the meantime, while you guys are voting for a minute, we're going to uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our players of the game. So watch this poll. All right, you guys can uh, fill that one out as we talk a little bit about the game. Uh, I think Matthew Trueblood, you probably uh, get to go first on the player of the game today. Yeah, uh, well, mine's going to be Kenta Maeda then, and I think. That's the no-brainer pick. Uh, what a performance again, although, you know, in, in a wonderful sort of way, it feels a lot like his other performances this year. Uh, not even the first time that he flirted with a no-hitter in a certain way, um, although obviously much closer than last time. Um, he's just, he's so impressive. The, the way he dominated as a Dodger is totally distinct from the way he's dominating as a twin. He's added a cutter and he's added a new shape to the slider. So instead of one slider, he essentially has three different pitches, especially when he's facing left-handed batters. He's using it as three different offerings and he's so much more willing to use that. There was a sequence against Braun uh, somewhere in the middle of the game. He went change up in slider away and then fastball right over the, the belt buckle. Right. And he just had no chance. Watching him carve guys up like that by just constantly violating expectations and putting so many pitches that he can throw right where he wants them into a batter's head that they tie themselves in knots or they take defensive swings. You even heard Dick Bremer and Burp Lylevin mention that a bunch tonight, that the swings don't look right. They don't look normal. And you can see that in his average exit velocities. That goes back to his Dodger days. But 
It's just he's so good at attacking and making the hitter feel like they are on the defensive, which in a certain way is always true of the pitcher-batter matchup. But some pitchers really make that live in the hitter's head, and some pitchers aren't able to. And Maeda has become a master at that, especially under Wes Johnson's tutelage here in Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I tweeted out, it's, we get him for four more years. Yeah. Uh, 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 or the rest of this year and then three years after this. When they traded for Maeda, one of the things that we talked about on the Gleam of the Geek podcast was that, you know, in a – if you take a look at what – and this was even when we thought Gratterall was still going to be starting. We said sort of, you know, the 75th percent – or the 80th percentile of where Gratterall ends up is Kenta Maeda. You know, so you're kind of selling high on a stock or pre-selling high on a stock when you pick him up. And, you know, the other thing that you have with Gratterall is you've got, you know, cost-controlled, fairly cheap guy. But Maeda is also under team control for four years. You know, my, you know Gratterall is going to be under team control for six. So, you know, you lose that on the back end and you'd be cheaper uh, than Maeda is going to cost you. But Maeda is not – insanely expensive. It's something like anywhere between what three and twelve million dollars basically every year. Um, right. It it's uh it's uh that might be a trade that we look back on you know four or five years from now and say, boy, that one was that was one hell of a good trade. And that they stuck with it and got it done despite all of the furor around it when the Red Sox backed out. Yeah, and also they while they sold on they sold high on Bruce Dar Gratterall, I feel like Maeda was also the perfect buy low guy where in Los Angeles he was a guy that sometimes got lost in the shuffle because of all of the stars that they have there and they have right. you know, they have all the great pitchers that he in the playoffs would get sent over back into the bullpen, both for contract reasons, but also just because they have so many great pitchers where the Twins were able to kind of find a guy that they think, well, the Dodgers might not be using him to his full potential, and I think that we could get him that way. And I'm sure they got input from Wes Johnson about what Matt was talking about, that we could implement a cutter, use a slider a little bit differently, and get more out of him. So while they sold high on Bruce Dar, I feel like he was the perfect buy low guy and they've we've seen that play out so far yeah, yeah you know that, you, uh, yeah oh sorry go ahead Matt go ahead Matthew True. I was just gonna say that that part at the end is exactly right I mean they and it takes a lot to look at uh, you know like the Dodgers the Astros these aren't the kinds of teams that you want to spend a lot of your time going what aren't they showing a guy that we might be able to because they're pretty good <laughs> right. at showing guys what they can do to be successful but it's clear that the Dodgers just because they needed Maeda only in this certain kind of limited way they never spent too much time digging into could you ramp way up on your slider usage against lefties and start to neutralize them more you know the the knock on him coming over was lefties handle him okay and tonight we saw the Brewers I mean essentially kind of use the lineup that they would normally use against the left-handed starter. That's the point that we've reached where Eric Sogard, who often leads off against righties was way down at the bottom of the lineup for Craig council, because he said, you know, I see Kenta Maeda coming and breaking bats and getting in on the handle with that cutter, throwing the slider right under the bat into the back foot. He's devastating against lefties now. And those little adjustments that, you know that the team who had him before was smart enough to make, but they just didn't necessarily need to. You can bring him in. Again, it's, it's a cost, you know, it's a responsible move from a cost perspective. You have control for a while, and it really looks like they just blew the ceiling off of what you can get out of Kenta Maeda by being willing and able to say, we need you in a bigger role than you were ever needed in before. Yeah, it's been, it's a really exciting development for this this twenty twenty team. I'm, I want to show I'm I'm sharing the poll results here. I won the first round, guys. Uh, my my take about Rocco's decision outlasted Matthew Taylor's. Matthew Trueblood, you've got some uh, ground to make up. Uh, <laughs> but you know you got Kenta Maeda as your player of the game. That's going to probably uh, do fairly well in the poll. Matthew Taylor, let's see if you can bounce back. Who did you have as your player of the game? 
Yeah, so my player of the game had sort of a more quiet game to start, but he ended the game, and it's Jorge Polanco. And it's because of the game, but also just because of Jorge in general and kind of the hitter that he's become. And I feel like outside of Nelson Cruz, there's nobody in a big spot that I would feel more comfortable up to the plate than Jorge Polanco. I just feel, and we were talking about this a little bit during the game, but just he's matured in a way where when he comes up to bat, you just know that he's going to put together a good at bat. He's going to put the bat on the ball. He's not going to go up and swing at crap. He's going to, you know, he's not going to be a potato out there. He's going to put a good, uh, a good at bat together. And we saw that tonight. We saw a big single down the, you know, he hit it the other way down the first baseline to give that huge second run in the seventh inning. And then we saw it again in the ninth. He put together a really good at bat. It was a nasty, not even a good looking broken bat single, but it won the game. And it's just kind of what you see from Polanco. He seems to be uh, willing to be, to, uh, he's not just a pull hitter. He's absolutely trying to use the whole field. He definitely trying to seem to be, you know, Sacrifice. I, I would say maybe sacrificing some some, you know, swing out of your shoes, swings and power to uh, make more contact. That ball down the right field line that was as a right-handed hitter. You know, he's actually quite a bit better as a left-handed hitter. So that hit that he did, which took down, was the opposite field hit, was uh, you know something that was from his weaker side. Um, yeah, I thought I was. I mean, I'm. I think we're probably not talking enough about a guy who's hitting over 300 right now in this lineup. Uh, we, we keep talking about all the guys who are hitting under 250 or 230, uh, and we don't pay that much attention to Polanco because he only got a couple homers and one double on the season. But he's really hitting for average right now. Uh, Matthew Trubov, what are you seeing out of Polanco? Yeah, I mean, everything you guys said, it's on a team that calls itself the Bomba Squad, it's kind of easy to lose in the shuffle a guy who – whose best skill will always be contact no matter what else he does. And we've seen him improve in other facets of his offensive game, but primarily he's a guy who can put the bat on the ball anytime he needs to really. And we saw that in that seventh inning. I mean, that was an O2 pitch and he fouled off the previous one too. And he just punched it. Uh, And that's a skill that isn't wildly valued in the game these days. It's certainly something that, He's not even necessarily emphasizing most of the time. He wants to blossom into a power hitter. He's maturing physically. Um, but he's still able to, at this point, you know, even a year ago, I'm not sure he was as able to or as willing to. But in that moment, he was able to shift gears, say, all right, it's 0-2. I know he's going to be trying to backdoor me, and I'm just going to look away and punch that ball down the right field line. Um, the situational awareness and the ability to lean on his primary skill uh, is so valuable and something that adds variety to this Twins offense. You know, Arias does that, but a lot of the rest of the guys, that's not their strength. And so to have Blanco doing it is wonderful. And we haven't even talked about the fact that his defense is better uh, this year, I think, quite a bit better. And, a lot uh, more confident charging balls, which we saw on, and, on one chopper tonight. And, and similar to Maeda, he's under contract like through 20, 2023 or 2024 uh, under team control. Uh, so uh, he could be around for a long time. Uh, uh, John, my player, sorry, go ahead, man. John make, yeah, John made a good point in the comments that Polanco probably made the biggest fielding play outside of Kepler's catch, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But it was in the 11th inning when they had runners on first and second, and there were – uh, two outs at the time, but it was a chopper to Polanco that was really tough, and he charged it, got it on a half hop, and got got a who was, it was yeah. Yorko who was running, and yeah, he got right. it probably by a half a step to end the yeah. end the eleventh inning. And if he wouldn't have made that, we would have had bases loaded with two outs, and so that was just another massive play, and I think sells my candidacy for Polanco for Player of the Game. Well, that's a good that's a good one. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose my Player of the Game choice is uh, Jorge Alcala. Um, pitching high, really, I mean, you can't get higher leverage innings than uh, running uh, runners on second base uh, in the uh, 10th or the, I guess in the 11th and the 12th inning uh, than what he did. And not only did he do it, he did it, uh, he lasted uh, two innings, uh, saving a bullpen that is absolutely depleted. This bullpen pitched, uh, you know, high leverage innings, both uh, in both sides of a doubleheader on Saturday. 
Then on Sunday, you went through basically your, most of your high leverage arms. And then they did a bullpen game yesterday where they held the team down to one run. And then they end up having to go into, uh, you have to go into the extra innings after Rogers kind of blows it to uh, rely on, uh, you know, basically the back end of the bullpen, the guys that you're not necessarily going to uh, trust. And that is, um, you know, you talked a little bit, Matthew Trueblood, about um, getting a trade for somebody that uh, you, you get from an organization that uh, you don't necessarily want to make too many trades with. That's the guy, the guy they picked up from the, uh, from the Astros for uh, Ryan Presley. Uh, and that's only half of what they got back. So uh, I'm really excited to see him in that bullpen role now for the next four or five years. And I think, <laughs> and he's blossoming just on time. I mean, literally blossomed just in time. Uh, you know, they, he was, he was not on the 28 man. He was not on the 30 man roster when the season started. Uh, he's uh, been a late addition and he's uh, now I can't imagine not having him in the bullpen. I can't imagine him sending him down, even if they, end up needing to uh, make some substitution changes. So, all right, let me uh, launch that poll here. Matthew Taylor had Polanco, Matthew Trueblood Maeda. I had Alcala. We're going to uh, now dwell, del delve into the, uh, see what, uh, who, who you guys think is going to be the player of the game or who at least made the best case for the player of the game. I bet Matthew Trueblood is going to do pretty well here. Although I liked your Polanco one, Matthew. Uh, uh, we the last one of the uh, the last one is going to be the um, just the uh, use of the obscure word. So I got to warn you guys, you got to get that obscure word. And if you haven't already, well, I'm going to be asking you what it was and what it was. Uh, I'm looking at the Q and A questions right now. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the, ex the decisions that went into that extra innings things. Uh, McLagan says I'm a Rocco fan, but I felt Rocco needs to be paying needs to do a better job of sticking up or protecting his players more, but also. Were you surprised the Twins aren't bunting with Adrianza or Avila? What? <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked the first time, especially after Adrianza laid down that bunt for the safety squeeze. And then I was uh, equally kind of shocked with Avila uh, that they ended uh, now Avila did end up advancing the runner. Um, but I mean, I could have even made a case that you, as crazy as it is, that you bunt with uh, Rosario in that case. I mean, you. You, you just have to get a runner from second. You have to get him over and get him in, and you win the game. And ended up, ended up going three innings. Um, I don't know. Were you guys similarly shocked, or can you defend that a little bit? I think it, the Adrianza one, that should have been a bunt. Uh, just <laughs> the way he's hitting this year, I don't, I don't understand what they were thinking having him swing away. Uh, the matchup wasn't good. Um, Avila makes more sense to me. He's a guy who can, especially against a, a right-hander who's facing David Phelps, he's a guy who can show some power, who can draw a walk. There are a lot of good things Alex Avila can do without laying down a bunt, including exactly what he ended up doing, which was just grounding the ball to the right side. Um, but Adrianza, if he's in that situation, if you're not bunting, it's just sort of a a – closed-minded in the opposite direction of what we're used to, a closed-minded aversion to the sacrifice bunt. That's one situation where it's, it's screaming for a sacrifice bunt. And I know uh, you didn't have the lineup perfectly behind Adrianza the way you'd like, you know, in terms of what you were setting up, but you get the bunt down, you move the runner over, and you move along because that was – we saw the, the ugly outcome that happened instead. Uh, that wasn't much – worse than the expected outcome if you have Adrianza swinging away right now. Looks like uh, Matthew Trueblood got the easy one. I mean, that's what happens when you get the first pick with the uh, the player of the game. You, you took, picked the obvious one and he, he won. Yeah. So that's something. I'm so, uh, on he, that. He, and I each have a, each, he and I each have a point. All right. Uh, let's see if we can ask or ask anybody else. Do you guys see anything in the uh, Q&A or in the chat things that you want to address? Uh. Well, there was yeah, a, think, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you, you first. Okay. I think we should talk a little bit more about Max Kepler's catch. Um, that was just massive and potentially a game saving catch. I know they ended up getting the run in the bottom of the 12th anyways, but that would have been at least a run there and they would have had the inning continuing for the Brewers and Max Kepler just made an unbelievable catch. It was an expected batting average of 0.920, which um, doesn't 
like Matt Trueblood, we were talking about, it doesn't exactly line up the catch probability with the expected batting average, but I would assume it was somewhere in the 10% or less of a percent of catch for Max Kepler on that play. And really why or what made the catch possible and what made Max stand out as a right fielder last season is he just has incredible feel and reflexes out in right field where he, as soon as he hears the crack of the bat and sees it, he makes a quick move and he seems to always make the right play, whether it's going back on the ball, going in on the ball, going left or right. He always knows exactly where to go, where he has speed. It's not all world speed, but he makes up with it with the incredible reflexes that he has. And that's exactly what we saw in that play where the only way that he could have caught that ball was by coming charging in on it right away. It was a low liner where he didn't have time to run to it. He doesn't have the speed to get to it that way, but with his reflexes where he was able to just come right in on the ball and get it on the low liner to potentially save the game was just massive. And it's, Kepler's just an unbelievable right fielder who I think is overshadowed by Buxton's defense in center field and the fact that he's had to play out of position so often. Um, but in right field, he's just something else. Uh, I think that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this game had everything, right? <laughs> it had some great defensive plays. It had some uh, puzzling decisions. It had a near no hitter. Uh, and also, I mean, we haven't mentioned Kenta Maeda struck out eight guys in a row setting yep. a, uh, a new Twins record and uh, falling just short of tying, I think, the American League record or the, and Major League Baseball record is, I think, 10 in a row. So, um, All right, let's get to the obscure word of the game, the, the day. Uh, Matthew Trueblood, what was your obscure word? How did you use it? I chose fraught, and I flipped it into the conversation about uh, the extra innings rule and how you know, teams were navigating fraught situations with traffic <laughs> well on the bases. I missed that one. Okay. Kind of, kind of an easy one, though. It feels yeah, like well, that was a little, little thing. Six years like to kind of took the low hanging fruit there. Matthew, yeah. how about you? Which one did you? Which, which one did you go after? So I used the word potato, and uh, in my talk about Jorge Polanco and uh, just how he might not, you know, he's got a lower OPS this year, but he's no potato. He's got an average <laughs> over three hundred, and he's just consistent and the kind of guy you want in your lineup. Very nice. Yeah. I had uh, popcorn, and I, I know Matthew Taylor caught me when I did it because he uh, almost burst out laughing saying it when I, when I sang it. It did the extra innings turned in. The, uh, having a, a runner at second base ended up being a, sort of a pass the popcorn situation. So, yeah, so I will uh, – let's see. Let's publish those out there, see who used it the best, and see if we end up having to do a, um, a uh, additional – Additional vote or not, or an additional game or not. Let's see. Uh oh, it's not looking too good. We might have to do. We might have to do a. Uh, we might have to do a tie breaker here. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like uh, Matthew Taylor is going to uh, pull out the the victory here. That gives us one across. The place of the way we were going to do a tiebreaker. Well, let me end the polling and show it here. Is yes. potatoes the big winner? Well, my popcorn thing deserves a little more credit, but apparently not. All right, that's all right. <laughs> all right, let's uh, so let's uh, let's tell you what. Let's take one question from the chat or one question from the Q and A. We each take our, our best stab at it, and then that'll be the uh, that'll be the tiebreaker question. All right. There's so a let's bunch see. Of questions in the Q and A. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, not the biggest strike zone. Uh, uh, you guys see one you want? <laughs> well, let's try, let me ask you this one. It's referenced by John in the questions and answers. Uh, and it's also referenced by uh, Joseph C. Joseph in uh, the question and answer. Uh, what should be your level of concern, one through ten? I'll, I'll put it on Taylor Rogers. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, man. You know, I think maybe a three. I'm not overly concerned with Taylor Rogers, and part of the reason is because of the other high-leverage bullpen guys that we have, where even if – 
if Taylor Rogers isn't the all world reliever that he was last year, I think that's okay. We have other guys in the bullpen that can go in that higher leverage spot. And we don't necessarily, I think last year we needed Taylor Rogers to be the guy that he was because especially early in the season, there weren't really the other relievers that we could count on, but you have Tyler Duffy, who's pitching like the best reliever in baseball. You have Trevor May, who might have the best stuff on the bullpen staff. You have Romo, who's been unbelievable since coming to the team. I don't know that you need Trevor or Taylor Rogers to be the guy that he was last year, which I think lowers the amount of concern that I have. I think he's still going to be a solid reliever, and he's going to be an excellent reliever. He might not be the excellent guy that we have but that just lowers my concern just knowing that we don't need him to be that guy so what's your level of concern one to ten? Ten and ten being the the most level of concern i'm a three three matthew trueblood i'm going to go higher uh i think a lot of it is just my philosophical approach to a relief pitcher like three is my level of concern at any given moment about the best <laughs> reliever in baseball um uh, with Rogers, I think you made a key point, Matthew, in that they just don't need him to be the same guy they needed him to be, even at this time last year, certainly before this point last season. Uh, because you trust Duffy, you trust May and Romo um, and Roger, you know, and, and those guys have progressed in the way they all get out left handed batters, too. So Rogers isn't as much of a necessity in a matchup sense. Uh, I will say, and I want to investigate it more, but it, it looks to me like he's just not, his arm angle's not quite as high. And that can mean a lot of things, but it can definitely lead to flattening out some stuff and making it harder for him to miss bats the way he was in the recent past. He's still a guy who's, he's always going to fill up the strike zone and that's good, but you're seeing the problem lately uh, with a guy who always fills up the strike zone. When something goes wrong, it's not a couple of extra walks. It's suddenly a, a parade of hits and hard contact. Uh, so I'd probably go with a six out of 10, which isn't catastrophic, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm a little concerned that we may not see that ace who was also gobbling up innings left and right that we got last year ever again. Uh, I turns out I've, I've learned something new about uh, webinars today. Uh, and that is that you can't do polls uh, once you start once you start a, a one. So uh, since I don't have a poll prepared for this a tiebreaker, I can't actually put up a poll to see which of you is right. I think I should be sitting out of it. So I'm just going to have uh, people put in the chat whether or not they want to vote for uh, Taylor or Trueblood for the uh, post game pint poobah while we uh, 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 wrap this one up for the thing. And then uh, that's who I will award, award the uh, award the post game pint poobah to. Uh, while you guys are uh, doing that, I'm going to uh, just kind of give you the, the deal here. We've got, uh, you'll find this recording posted tonight or early tomorrow morning, probably more accurately at this point. Isn't it already uh, early tomorrow morning? <laughs> it's already, it already is. Uh, uh, at uh, our Twins Daily YouTube channel. You can also find it on our Twins Daily Facebook page. You can also find an audio version of each of these on the Twins Daily podcast, uh, which you can find out on iTunes or wherever you go get your uh, your uh, Wherever you wherever you download your your podcast from, you can find that, and uh, that'll be there just sitting there waiting for you if you subscribe. Uh, you can also go to the uh, recap, the daily recap of Twins Daily every day, and you can find this video there. Or you can go to Post Game Pint and find out both a when the uh, next Post Game Pint is going to be, and b uh, the latest video from the la the last one too. So let's see what we got for votes here. We got, I got Taylor. I got Richard Taylor. voted for Matt. Taylor. Which I appreciate. Taylor, Taylor, True Blood, Taylor, Taylor, True Blood, Taylor, True Blood. I think Taylor's got it. Matthew yeah. Taylor, you are the post game point Puba. Congratulations. You get to retain that title until tomorrow night, which is when the next post game pint is going to be. Uh, it will be following the Brewers game after the last out. Hopefully, that last out will be much earlier than this one. Uh, I want to thank everybody for stopping by, and uh, thank you very much to Matthew Taylor and Matthew True Matthew Trueblood for sticking sticking it out and sticking out this late, watching the game with me. And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow night. Win Twins. Thanks, guys. Thank you both.